Take a look at a map of the American mainland, and then compare it to a map of Europe or South America. You'll notice that the majority of the U.S. states are square or rectangular shaped, particularly in the Midwest and Western states. Even countries with similar colonial histories like Canada and Australia have uniquely shaped provinces and states. In fact, if you were to look at an American map without the state names, would you be confident in naming each one accurately? Because of the largely grid-like pattern of some states, being able to quickly differentiate Nebraska, Colorado, and Utah could be trickier than it sounds. Why then does America have so many square states? Were they created out of a concept of equality, or was it more to do with a stricter adherence to land sizes? Well, it's a combination of both, actually, plus one or two other deciding factors. When America won the War of Independence in 1776, the 13 colonies in the east became official states. To the west lay over 400 square kilometers, roughly 155 square miles, of unsettled land, just waiting to be snapped up. However, the new federal government was keen to allocate land plots more stringently. The most important thing was to establish new territories as American land before they fell to the hands of rival governments like France and England. The plan was to subdivide the vast interior and sell off plots of land for federal revenue. If possible, the new plots of land would be divided up into evenly sized parcels that would remain uniform across the country. The original 13 states from Massachusetts down to Georgia had boundaries that were drawn up as they were established. These state borders were often dictated and defined by the surrounding landscapes, such as mountain ranges and rivers, which led to an uneven pattern of shaped states and sizes, with some triangular shaped and others jutting inland from the coast. Many people thought that a more consistent system of dividing up land would be better, as America turned its attention to the mass of uncolonized land to the west. Thomas Jefferson played an active role in setting up the new system of land planning. Much of Jefferson's core values were based on the concept of equality and opportunities for all. Ideally, he wanted to shape a nation where everyone had the right to acquire equal sizes of land, which led to the creation of the Land Ordinance of 1785. This was a system that allowed settlers to purchase individual lots of land based on north to south and east to west grids. Jefferson suggested that new states in the Midwest should follow a pattern of 2 degrees latitude by 4 degrees longitude. This amounted to a state border being roughly 220 kilometers, 137 miles in height, and 440 kilometers, or 273 miles in width. The logic was simple. Square-shaped lots of land were easy to draw up, and they could merge increasingly larger squares of towns and then counties. The land ordinance created the Rectangular Survey System, or Public Land Survey System, otherwise known as the PLSS. The job of the PLSS was to decide and impose strict guidelines on how land would be subdivided. While the new state borders didn't stick exactly to Jefferson's suggested measurements, the land plots would follow his recommended rectangular-shaped grids. This would then form districts, which formed towns, and then regions, and then eventually entire states. For example, the PLSS decreed that towns should be roughly 6 square miles or 9 square kilometers and running due north to south. It went on to rule that towns and countries should meet each other at right angles, thus maintaining the grid system. The idea was for this to create a series of square and rectangular shaped plots of land that would connect and form larger square shaped regions. This concept was first put into action in eastern Ohio, in a land tract called the Seven Ranges. The Seven Ranges were set up just west of the Ohio River. The chunk of land was measured out at 68 kilometers, 42 miles, along the horizontal northern border, and 146 kilometers, roughly 90 miles, for the vertical west, with the southern and eastern borders lying on the Ohio River. As dictated by the new survey instructions, this was then subdivided into smaller and smaller blocks. The smaller pieces of land became counties, and within counties were townships. Towns were further divided into 36 sections, each being approximately 2.5 square kilometers, or just under one square mile. Each block of land throughout the seven ranges ran north to south while being intersected by east to west lines. They were all systematically numbered and recorded. The numbered section of a town's 36 sections resembled a bingo card of a 6x6 grid of numbers in order from 1 to 36. This meticulous and seemingly rigid system of subdividing land was appealing for several reasons. First of all, it was easy to track and monitor. By allotting numbers for each plot of land sold, the government could easily keep tabs and monitor the growth of townships and the eventual formation of states. The consistent and uniform system also represented core values such as equality and growth that the American government was so keen to reinforce. On paper, it probably seemed like a straightforward exercise. Move into unsettled regions, survey the land, and then draw up plots. However, the reality was a little more complicated. Surveying and subdividing new plots of uncleared land was a tough day at the office. 
Surveyors had to contend with working in the harsh winters and the scorching heat. Food supplies were scarce, and they had to fend off hostile attacks from native tribes, who were only too aware of what was taking place. The surveying tools were outdated and barely functional, plus measuring straight lines in thick underbrush or forest was challenging, to say the least. Despite the hardships, surveyors managed to send their maps to the General Land Office, which then sold off plots of land. Expansion really opened up in 1803, when France sold off its American territories to the U.S. with the Louisiana Purchase. The French needed to free up finances for an imminent war with Britain, and Thomas Jefferson was only too happy to pounce on a colossal expanse of land for a modest price. The Louisiana Purchase gave America a whopping 2 million square kilometers, which is a little over 770,000 square miles of new land, which accelerated settlement across the nation. As the settlers moved further and further west, more plots of land were seized up, which led to new towns, which grew into counties and then states. Many of the newly formed states were far bigger than the first visualized by Jefferson. Washington, Wyoming, Colorado, Oregon, North Dakota, and South Dakota were all roughly 770 kilometers or 480 miles wide. And North and South Dakota, Kansas, and Nebraska are around 320 kilometers or 200 miles in height. Some states such as Texas and California were the only exception to the rule. These huge states were already more or less formed and had been partially settled by the Spanish. By the early 19th century, both states also wielded considerable political power, making Congress wary of upsetting the apple cart by redefining their borders. Sticking to the grid system of land allocation elsewhere was contrarily made easier due to much of the new land being uninhabited, at least by other settlers, which meant that nobody could protest about unfair border rulings or subdivisions. Surveyors simply traveled across the vast Midwest and Western regions, drawing up grids and selling them off as they went. The development of America's vast railway network also meant that surveyors no longer had to stick close to rivers. Until the railway boom, settlements were made in proximity to rivers, which were a major form of transport and access to supplies. Train lines could be built to crisscross the country, and they could reach the most remote regions of America's interior and western plains. Not long after the historic Louisiana Purchase, further settlement was encouraged across the Midwest by the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. The waterway linked New York to the Great Lakes, and it spurred a huge wave of migration west of New York State. The canal provided a direct route of transport for goods and people, which led to the birth of new states such as Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. Again, these new states were created using the grid system of selling squared blocks of land that quickly grew into towns and ultimately states. As was often the case, some land for the newly formed states was taken from the other states. For example, Large areas of Ohio were originally claimed by Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. But as settlement in Ohio continued to grow, these states eventually ceded land to Congress. Virginia and Connecticut gave up four and three million acres respectively to allow Ohio to flourish into what would become one of the nation's industrial powerhouses. In 1862, the Homestead Act was passed, which encouraged settlements to reach the furthest corners of the American frontier. The act enabled anyone over the age of 21 to apply for a free federal land grant. Their only stipulation was that they were a U.S. citizen and they had never fought against America in any war, the latter of which was difficult to prove anyway. North Dakota, Nebraska, Colorado, and Montana particularly benefited from the Homestead Act, as settlers rushed to acquire sizable plots of arable land. Today, the American state's sizes fluctuate widely with huge states such as Alaska and Texas dwarfing the much smaller areas like Rhode Island and Delaware. However, the majority of states are all at least similar in shape, if not size. The average size of a U.S. state is roughly 195,000 square kilometers, or 75,000 square miles. Maybe now, if you look back at a map of the U.S., the huge number of square-shaped states starts to make a Thank you.